parents to get you to come out here with your kids. That's rad. I appreciate that. Thanks so much for tuning in to watch this video. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for new punk rock videos every week and tap the bell to get notified when new videos drop. This video was brought to you by The Coldest Water Bottle. You can check the link in my description to win one of these water bottles or for 10% off all your purchases. My name is Aaron Micklow and I'm here with Chris Demick from Less Than Jake. How are you? I am fantastic. How are you, Aaron? I'm good. We're at a festival. We are. We are at a festival. <laughs> of your Pop Punk Still Not Dead tour. And I saw the original flyer for that. It was actually Simple Plan that was the co-headliner with Newfound Glory. Can you talk about how that happened where they dropped out and you guys stepped in? Yeah, uh, they wouldn't let him in the U.S. A couple of those guys have been arrested in Civil Plan before. So. Oh, wow. No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, I was going to say. <laughs> They're like the nicest guys in the world. Uh, they just didn't feel, uh, I think, comfortable coming back out. I think they had some other stuff going on within, within their band. Uh, I'm not really sure. I, I was told that uh, they just weren't ready to, to go back on the road with, uh, you know, what's going on with, uh, you know, the, the virus. So yeah. they, uh, they backed, uh, backed out about two, three weeks before the thing was supposed to happen. And Newfound was scrambling because all the, all the shows were already ready to go. And we stepped in. Yeah, because I saw it was like what they kind of had postponed it at first, right? Was that I? No, they didn't. The tour was never postponed. Okay. It was, it was just uh, all of a sudden we were on the flyer where, where <laughs> Simple Plan's name was. Yeah, I was a little confused when I saw that because I was Googling it and then I was like, wait, this is the same flyer. Like they wouldn't do this exact same artwork for a different tour. Correct, correct. <laughs> yeah, so Newfound and the other two bands on the bill, uh, Hot Mulligan and Lolo, they both wanted to uh, continue to do the tour and they, like I said, they looked for had a couple other bands that they had asked and they, they couldn't do it and you know they asked us and we could yeah so here we are yeah it is a thing like you know there's a lot of I've experienced it as well just on my end of things of like some bands don't want to do interviews because it is kind of like this new world that we're in of like we're still in this pandemic is like people are it's all about people's comfort levels of like mm -hmm. what are they comfortable with and we all kind of just have to respect each other about like our choices yeah I you said it perfect <laughs> what, what could I possibly add to that well, so in the pandemic, in December 2020, you guys finally released your new album, Silver yes. Linings. Can you talk about, you know, the making of the album? I know that you guys had said in other interviews that it was like, you guys had kept postponing putting it out, and then you're finally like, we just have to put this out. It can't wait any longer. Yeah, you know, we had recorded it in the fall of 2019, and it was just time to put it out. You know, we kind of went back and forth with our label, Pure Noise Records, who... Uh, you know, was pushing it back because, you know, we all thought last year at some point we'd be able to go back on the road and uh, that didn't happen. And, it, you know, got to the point where we just were sitting on this record. And we wanted to get it out. So, yeah, that was really that was really, really the story. It just was, it was time. It had been we put it out a year after it was recorded. Yeah. And I, I've seen that with a lot of other artists, you know, in the pandemic. And it, you know, it was therapeutic for the fans because it's like we had new music to listen yeah. to to help get us through these hard times. But then I can understand from the band side of it, it's hard to like put an album out and not be able to tour it. Like, I know you guys did some live stream shows, right? We did, you know, and I mean, everything's so much different now. If this was back when we started, it would have been devastating because people were actually selling a ton of records. So... It was more for our fans, us just wanting to get it out. You know, yeah. it had nothing to do with wanting to go out and promote it or anything like that because, you know, we've been a band for, for so long now. We have so many songs that luckily that people want to hear that we can play those. We don't have to rely on, on new records and uh, we still love making music, but it, it's not like it was in the past. Yeah, I've heard you say that in other interviews about kind of that time when you guys were signed to the major labels and like specifically as one thing that you said that stuck out in my mind was about how like the last hurrah of that last one where you knew that the shift was coming because YouTube was coming out yeah. and they like put you guys in that house where you had like a $400 a day per deal. Yes. <laughs> for food and booze and you used it all every day. Pretty much. I mean, the, <laughs> the writing was kind of on the wall and we had been around long enough at that point. That was our second 
second hurrah with the major labels. We got signed twice, once to Capitol. That was with Warner Brothers, what you're speaking of. Yeah. And we kind of knew, you know, this is... Uh, this is the the fact that we got signed twice was a miracle in and of itself and we were going to take everything we could because we knew the ride wasn't going to last very long and it didn't yeah i mean it is a major crazy. label ride <laughs> beginning of, of you guys being a band, you know, the way that you went about it was like, I thought it was really smart to get on all those comps to get you guys out without spending the money to tour. And now it's like, that's what social media is for bands. Yeah, that was uh, old man's social media was the compilations. You know, you, you, you said it per perfectly. It was, you know, you'd want to get on a compilation in Chicago, one in Detroit, one in New York, one in Jersey. So that when you went there, you hope that, you know, regionally that comp sold well. And the, some of the bands that were on the compilation from the area you could do a show with so you weren't playing to two people in the bartender which we played a lot of those shows too some of those were the best ones i know like when you walk into those shows like i've i've been with artists in those shows like that and it's just like oh it's like womp womp oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you still have to play to your best ability yeah and, and and you just play like you're playing to an arena you know yeah so yeah. It can be fun. <laughs> I always wonder that for artists because it's just like, oh, fuck, there's no one here. Like, how do you do that? How do you find, do you just like find a spot on the wall or? Well, there's been, an, luckily, there's been a long time since it's been like that for, for less than Jake. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it never really mattered to us. It was, you know, especially the older we got as, as a band, it's like, this is what we do uh, as a career. And you can never say this in the 90s because they call you a sellout. But it's like, if they're paying us and it's a gig, there's, you know, if there's 200 people or 20,000 people, we're going to do the same show. Yeah, for sure. Well, so can you talk about your founding member, Vinny, leaving the band? Can you talk? I, I understand that it was like good terms that he left. He just didn't want to tour anymore. But, you know, him being a founding member and being in the band for as long as he was, how was that for you? And like, what were your feelings about it when he announced his departure? Oh, I mean, I've known him since I was 15 years old. It was, you know, it wasn't. Yeah, you know, we were like we were jumping up and down for joy. It was it was tough, you know. Yeah. Um, he's my friend since I was 15 years old, but uh, you know, he, as you said, wanted to be a father, wanted to be home with his daughter, yeah. and we had spent when he left. He had been in the band for 26 years at that point, tw almost 27 years. Yeah. And he, you know, wanted to be home, and you can't be home and raise a, a child when you're out doing this all the time. So yeah, uh, he he wanted to step back, and and, and like I said, it was. It was a shock to everybody, and it wasn't like we were, we were jumping up and down for joy. It was it was tough, uh, but we wanted to go on as a band, and and so we have. Yeah, and how was that? Because he wrote a lot of the songs, right? So transitioning without him, he wrote the lyrics. Yeah. So Roger and I have always written, and and Jr. Sax player since he's been in the band, we've always written the songs, the melodies, the songs, and Vinny would come in with the ideas, the lyrical inspirations and you know we would take those and we would mold those into songs sometimes they would be fully written lyrics other times they'd be just you know uh, uh, some you know chicken scratch on a paper that we would formulate into a song so we were always there with him I and mean, that's how I learned to write songs was with him so yeah. since I was 15 so it was never weird to for me to sing somebody else's lyrics and be able to sell it you know like like they're mine because I that's all I ever had so yeah um, and with him leaving it, it was only weird in the aspect that you know we never really as a band lyrically any of the rest of us ever came with full songs we've always written full songs on our own but that was kind of his department so we still had lyrics and songs and stuff laying around but you know we never had used them in the past because we had him so yeah. it, it wasn't that strange to go do the record because we've always written all of us
of projects on your own that you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> you got your hands full. You've got your podcast. Yes. Which I was checking out. Yes. Ooh, you got a beat. You got a beat. It's oh on you. Oh my god! Don't hit it. It'll sting me. <laughs> don't hit it. It'll sting me. <laughs> you gonna keep this in the episode? There it is. Oh my god. Oh now my he's. Uh oh. oh he's my on. God. I'm like mildly allergic. <laughs> <laughs> this is so. I nice would have already had him off you. <laughs> this is so not funny. Oh my god. I'm not gonna slap the bee where it's at on you. Though. Okay, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Two bad places for that bee to be on your face or where it was, and I'm not gonna slap you in either place. All right. <laughs> maybe maybe cut this. Yeah, I will cut this. <laughs> this, this will be or leave it. I don't know. This can be in the bloopers. <laughs> Give me a minute to compose myself. I'm like, I'm you gotta get you gotta get the slate out again. She, I'm seriously mildly allergic. Like I almost went to the hospital in Germany when I got stung by one. It was not. That's your punk funny. rock name, anaphylactic. <laughs> okay. Cut. No, let me. All right, we're still here. Okay. All right. Picking back up, this is still Krista Bakes with Lesson Jake. I'm here with Aaron, and uh, yeah, you'll, we had to cut because you'll see the bloopers reel later. <clears throat> okay, so before I almost got stung by a bee, let's continue on where we left off about your podcast. Yes. I was listening to, um, I scrolled through the episodes. You have a podcast that's about like cut, breaking down songs with artists. Yes. And the one that caught my eye was Josh Todd, Crazy Bitch, because I'm fucking obsessed with that song. I okay. love him. And okay. I was like, I love that you interviewed him because like, you know, I mean, they're not, I know they have like punk roots, but it's not traditionally like a punk band. Uh -huh. So how did you start your podcast? Like what, how did you come up with the concept for it? So I uh, basically was doing some animation. I, I do custom songs and jingles on the side yeah. for businesses, for anybody. If you want a song for your boyfriend or your husband or your wife, <laughs> I'll write it. And um, so I wanted to do a promotional cartoon and my friend Chris, who plays bass in this band Punchline, He's an animator, he draws. So I, I had hired him, hadn't talked to him really in a while. We had we had done a tour together the previous year, but um, it had been a minute since like we, we had talked, talked. And we started just almost like talking every day because of this video. And one thing led to another, we're talking about, you know, can't go out and, and, and do what we do because we were in the middle of, of a lockdown. Yeah. And he said, you should do a podcast. I was like, what? I'm not doing a podcast. Because yeah. there's just so many of them out there and, and yeah. a lot of them were just really, really bad. And, and I didn't want to do it just from the standpoint of I've done enough interviews that uh, that aren't good. This isn't one of them, but I've done enough that weren't good. I'm like, I don't want to interview. He's like, it's not going to be an interview. You know, you should do it about songwriting. That's what you're doing. You're writing these songs. It'll be a vehicle for you to get the word out there and yeah. you should have a theme and stick with it. And so I had woke up the next morning and I said, you know what? And I just, I texted like 20 guys on my phone, John Feldman being one of them. He was the first episode, John from Goldfinger. And I got like a dozen responses back. I think we recorded like 10 episodes the first week. Just yeah. dove right in. Cause you know so many people. It's like yeah. when you, you know, put that in and you know about recording and know how to make things sound good. So it's just like, you know, it wasn't such an uphill battle I would imagine. No, it wasn't. It became that when it's like, okay, now I'm running out of guys that I know in the punk rock scene and who else do I know? And I, I know quite a few other people too so I've been you know and I really wanted to to branch out from the beginning I told Chris once it started rolling and people were liking it mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be one dimensional I didn't want it to just be punk or ska and I knew I was doing something good when I started getting the hate mail when you get you know it hasn't been too much I say hate. it's like I, I haven't had an artist in three weeks that I liked I'm like yeah because they haven't been punk or ska so if you're here for that you're kind of in the wrong place because I don't want it to be just that because there's yeah. so many interesting songs that are of every genre I want to be all inclusive yeah, and it's it's about going after artists that you like. Like I mean, like I said, it was surprising to me that you had Josh Todd on. I was like, oh, I love this. Right. Well, that was kind <laughs> of a you know a, a tip of the hat again to Goldfinger. So their former bass player Kelly Lemieux, Kelly plays bass in Goldfinger. I yeah. Mean, in Buckcherry. So I just hit up Kelly one day. I said, hey, it's, you know, could you pass my info along to Josh? And and he did. And there you go. <laughs> Talk about your book and your solo album yeah. titled the same, Blast from the Past. You got it. 
and then you're you're doing like it's like a, a really long book tour, like 18 months, right? Where you're releasing songs every few months. Is that yeah, true? Yeah. So I've been I've been doing that. The book came out uh, the same time as the the album came out, not by chance, and I didn't want that to happen. It just uh, the way it was, but the book came out in December 2020. It's called Blast from the Past, as you said. Um, and uh, hey, there's some weirdo. <laughs> I think he's the third basis for Goldfinger. Um, <laughs> good to see you. But uh, so I did this picture book that has accompanying stories with it. We have, actually have it for sale today here. And uh, the book came out, and I didn't want to just to have the book come out and that be it. I did it with Smart Punk Records, which is a record label, punk rock record label. And I thought, you know, if we did. Uh, you know, a seven inch every couple months, you know, with different merchandise items, it would reinvigorate, you know, the book and the sales. And so that's yeah. what we've done. And, and next year, the full solo record will be out. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's a really smart idea. I mean, you've always, it seems like from the research I've done and other interviews I've watched, you always have really good business and marketing ideas. I love that. Yeah. You know, you, you, I've learned a lot along the way. I'm still learning of what, mostly what not to do. For real. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you, you this, this is a weird this is a weird backhanded business. The music industry is not, you know, you read all the stories that are, most of them are true. You know, it's a, uh, it's a tough business to get ahead in. You have to be smart and savvy and you know, I'm, I'm still learning. So yeah. I think when I'm not learning, then I'm retired. I don't know. Well, so let's close with, can you share some of your weird stories from your career as a band? Like weirdest stories at shows and touring or, I how mean, long, I know in the how, early how days, long you, you got, we should probably sit down for this one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just, there's too many, you know, you gotta, you gotta remember, especially in the early days, you know, most of the punk rock places we were playing then, a lot of them were inner city. This is before cities started to come back, downtown Baltimore. I mean, cities have really, you know, uh, lack of a better word, come back over there. They've been revitalized. Yeah. But a lot of these, these were just punk rock, just bad dive bars. You'd get there and look around, and there's a liquor store, a check cashing place, a bail bonds. You're in, you're in that part of town. And it's just, you know, they, they, were, they were dangerous. Skinheads were still going to shows. So it was sketchy in, in that as it was sketchy in that aspect. Um, like you mean like the the racist skinheads? Yeah, 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 especially in Florida at that time. Oh God, yeah. I'm I'm originally from Florida as well. I was born in Gainesville and I okay. grew up in Tampa. Okay, okay. Um, but you know, I, I I left when I graduated high school, so I don't really I didn't have the same experience. <laughs> you identify with California better, yeah. Yeah. Well, but so I mean, just from that alone, just the sketchiness of that. I mean, there's just so many stories, and I, I tried my best to, you know when I recall things like this, uh, be careful what I say, because yeah. some things that I don't think are a big deal because it happened so long ago, they're, they're so sketchy that I don't even want to say them. And I, I like, it's trying to, I'm trying to think of something PG 13 that I can talk about. Yeah. Um, There's always those things of behind you know, the okay, scenes of shows. Okay. So I'm, I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> always have been. I, I like them, but I'm just, they, they make me wheeze and sneeze and all that good <laughs> stuff and itch. So, I used to sleep in the van a lot because when we were sleeping on floors in the early days, every punk rocker had a cat. <laughs> so I would sleep in our van. It could be 25 degrees. I'd be in two sleeping bags. And one night we're outside of Philly somewhere. It's like 3.30 in the morning. And I, I hear, <coughs> and I look up and there's these two dudes with a screwdriver trying to break into the front. So I just jump up. I got a baseball bat in there, but I jump up and I just lay the horn on and these guys took off running. That's really smart. Yeah. So there's, you know, that's just one instance of many. At, at shows, I've seen the sketchiest things you could ever imagine. We were playing London about five years ago. It was a three-story, it was, you know, floor, second balcony, third balcony. Mm -hmm. So this guy's up probably 30 feet in the air. And he decided, I see him mid-song, that he's going to stage dive from there. <laughs> yeah. The whole crowd parts. This guy goes down. <gasps> yeah, they had to stop the show. They had to bring a helicopter in. You know, and up to that point, we was were, it like a festival? Why did they bring a no, helicopter? No, it was us and Real Big Fish. We were over there. Uh, they brought a helicopter in because it was the middle of central London. Luckily, okay. they could bring a medivac in because there was a park across the street yeah. from this venue, but it was middle of, of London. Yeah. And uh, they came in and took him away. It turns out he, he was okay. But up to that point, the show, we were, we were playing last that night. It was a fever pitch. Place was going nuts. And we came back 40 minutes later, and it was just like... What a fucking uh, idiot, though. Like, I mean, yeah. in what world is like, this is a great idea? Uh, probably as shit-faced as he was. He thought it was the greatest idea ever. So that, what an that, idiot. I think that had something to do with it. And I mean, poor guy, but like, what? Like, he did it to himself. Yeah. It's like, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, no. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, it, it runs the gamut. And there's a million, <laughs> million, million other stories, coincidences, embarrassing things, things that I just can't even talk about. A lot of it's in my book, though. You can find it in my book. There's some good stories in there. 
Well, I want to close with that and say thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hey, this is Krista Makes from Less Than Jake, and you are watching Last Rockers TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah.